We are continuing uh, our series on the biblical doctrine of rewards. And this is, again, a three-part series, and there is uh, much to speak of, but uh, we'll be here in our second part this morning and pick this up again in a couple of weeks. We looked last week at the doctrine of God and the relationship of some particular attributes of God to the doctrine of rewards. And if you remember, we thought about who God is in many of his attributes, his righteousness, his justice, his wrath, and then his love and mercy and grace. And that this was critical for setting a foundation for thinking about rewards because when God rewards believers for a life yielded in obedient faith, he is not obligated to give something as if we have given to God something that he then must pay us back for. Now, what have you received or what do you have that you did not receive, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Everything that we do that God would reward us for from yielded life of faith and obedience to him in this life, anything God would give us as reward for those things is God giving and giving and giving to the undeserving. Rewards in the New Testament are all of grace. They are not obligation. They're not some sort of business transaction between God and believers. They are all a generous God who gives and gives and gives. And we will no doubt be stunned and surprised when God gives rewards to believers for the things that only God could produce in the lives of believers. When everything that we could have brought to the table by our own nature, by our own attributes, by our own capacities in the flesh is burned up. So we're gonna revisit this this morning and we're gonna put together some of the biblical data from a lot of different passages on the New Testament doctrine of rewards um, and then the next time we're together, we're going to do a deep dive into one text. So let's pray as we get started this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being so big, so good, so holy, righteous and just, full of righteous wrath against those things which you hate, and full of mercy and kindness to us who have perpetrated the very things that you hate and yet have found favor in you, favor in your eyes, favor in your heart. We have experienced your love. We have experienced forgiveness, all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you give and you give and you give to your children. Uh, we are thankful for these things. We pray that this doctrine, this neglected doctrine would resonate in our hearts that it would motivate us to lives lived fervently, that it would motivate us to increasing gratitude, uh, increasing diligence and holiness and usefulness. God, we want our lives not to be wasted, but to echo into eternity with treasures that you have promised to store up. That is where our heart needs to be, Oh God, that is where our, we want our hearts to be. Increase our faith and use your word to do it in Jesus' name, amen. One of the things we need to tackle as we think about a biblical doctrine of rewards is simply the question, does the doctrine of rewards work against the doctrine of salvation by justification? Grace alone, faith alone, eternal life as a free gift of God. Does a, does a doctrine of doing good works unto rewards work against the doctrine of salvation? The answer to that, of course, is absolutely not. God freely, of his own accord, saves, not on the basis of any merit that we have, but he causes new birth grants his Holy Spirit to give faith and repentance, both of which are a gift of God. None of that is from ourselves. And God creates life where there was only spiritual death. That is completely free, unobligated grace from God to those who could never earn it nor deserve it. 
and the same God who saves us freely by justifying grace through the death of his son also promises rewards for those who walk in the good works that he purposed for them to walk in, Ephesians 2.10. So we're gonna look at some passages and as we walk through some of the details of rewards, we're gonna be flipping from place to place so you can get your Bibles ready and we'll ask a few questions just to help clarify what is this doctrine and how does it relate to the gospel. And when we talk about the doctrine of rewards, we're speaking specifically of the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat judgment. And I want you to turn to Romans chapter 14. Bema is not an English word, but it has come into the vocabulary of theologians who are employing the Greek word for a judgment seat that is here in this text. And so as you work through theologically the various judgments uh, at the end of time, uh, there are several, and this is the one that gets referred to as the Bema seat judgment or the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10 refers to it. Paul writes there, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And the word seat there is the Greek word bema. So if you read that word, you hear that word, it, it simply refers to this seat we'll talk about in just a moment. Flip over to 2 Corinthians chapter five. Paul there also makes reference to this judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And again, that same word for seat appears. This is the bema seat. And a bema seat was either a reference to the raised platform or the official seat or throne that was upon that raised platform. The bema was the position Pilate took as Jesus was examined in John 19. It was the position that Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, took when Paul was being cross-examined in Acts 18. And this is a raised, elevated platform with a seed, and it was used of local officials and judges and magistrates, even umpires for athletic games and rewards were dispensed and judgments and assessments were made from that seat on the raised platform. And so here Christ is said to have a bema seat and to execute judgment from this seat. And this bema seat judgment is distinct from the other end times judgments. You have of course the sheep and goats judgment from Matthew 25. That is the judgment where Jesus will separate out the nations of those who physically survive the great tribulation. And they will be separated as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And there will be those who enter into life in his kingdom and others who are reserved for eternal judgment. That is not this judgment. There are believers and unbelievers there separated out on the basis of their lives. And it's also different than the great white throne judgment. You're familiar with that from Revelation chapter 20. At the great white throne judgment, all of the wicked dead from all time are lined up before the great white throne where Jesus himself sits and adjudicates all of the punishment for every single evil deed of every single unbeliever of all time. And the books are opened and all the deeds are exposed and every single person lined up at that judgment does not have his or her name found written in the Lamb's Book of Life and is thrown into the lake of fire. That is different than the judgment seat we see here in Romans 14 and 2 Corinthians 5. At the Bema seat judgment, it is not the sheep and goat judgment, it is not the great white throne judgment of the unbelieving dead. This is, in fact, an assessment of the life of believers. Only believers show up at the Bema Seat Judgment. Where does this take place? Not on the earth. This takes place after the resurrection and before the return of Christ. 
when does this happen? Uh, this takes place between uh, the resurrection that Jesus mentions in Luke 14 and the glorious return in Revelation 19.8 where the saints who have already been evaluated are clothed in the righteousnesses Interestingly, in Revelation 19.8, that is plural. It's not the justifying righteousness with which all believers are covered by Christ. It is the righteousnesses that God has produced in them during the Christian life in which they are clothed when they return with Christ to the earth. So this takes place after the church age, before the glorious return of Christ, and in heaven, not on earth. Who will be there? And we said this already, believers will be there. Believers from the church age will be assessed at this judgment of rewards. And specifically, individual believers will be present. This assessment will be individual and personal. It's not some sort of collective assessment. Oh, look, the, the church age believers all did a good job. <laughs> Well done, good and faithful servants. No, this is individualized. It is very personal. No one gets lost in the crowd. Look down again at 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed. Do you see that? There is the whole body of believers and each one is individually, personally assessed. The same thing is true in Romans 14.10. We all will stand before the judgment seat of God. Look at verse 12. Each one of us will give an account of himself to God. The same personalized, individualized reality uh, is also seen in the discussion of this judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at 1 Corinthians 3.13. Paul writes there, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And the last chapter of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22 makes this personalized assessment clear again. Revelation twenty two twelve. 12, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. So this is an individualized, personal assessment of believers. And, and remember what a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is. A believer in Christ is a slave you were born a slave, a slave of sin under the dominion and the tyranny of sin. You were rescued from that tyranny and transferred into another dominion, Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, and that dominion is the dominion of Christ. And you have not been taken from slavery to sin to some sort of autonomous independence, but to a newfound slavery, a slavery to Christ. We are slaves of him. Slaves of righteousness leading to eternal life. Slaves of God, slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And think about what this newfound slavery means for us. It, it means we are obligated. He is our master. It also means that we are loved. That old slave master hated you, designed everything in your life to bring about your ruin and your ultimate destruction. This new slave master loved you with his own life, gave himself up for you. And Jesus to his disciples at one point said, I no longer call you slaves, I call you friends. Uh, every other depiction of the, of the slave relationship in the New Testament still calls us doulos, slaves. Um, and there's a reality that this slave relationship is one where Jesus has a personal affection for us as friends, even brothers and co-heirs, we are adopted sons and daughters of his father. Really remarkable realities. But in the end, what does it mean that we should say? Jesus' own words were, when all is said and done, just say we were slaves and we did what we were supposed to. And that leads us to a, a, another indication that the surprisal at the rewards judgment would be, I just did what I was supposed to do. 
You loved me, you gave yourself up for me, I am yours. I live at your behest. And God dispenses rewards for faithful obedience. It's just grace. What will be assessed at this Bema seat judgment, this judgment seat of rewards? Well, first we must say what is not assessed. Your standing in Christ is not assessed. Remember, everyone at this judgment is a believer. It is not your standing in Christ, but your stewardship of the Christian life. How did you live your life from new birth to home going? How has the believer employed time and talents and relationships, opportunities and capacities for the glory of God, for the progress of the gospel, for the building up of the church, for worship as a way of life, living sacrifices, Romans 12, 2. This assessment is not a judgment regarding sin. It's not a judgment regarding sin. Uh, Romans 8, 1 is clear. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is only those who are in Christ Jesus who are at this judgment, and this judgment is not about condemnation, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. John 5, 24, Jesus said that those who believe in him have passed out of death into life. They have gone away from judgment, which is a judgment for sin unto condemnation. 1 John 4, 17 says that God loves us and gives us a confidence in him in the day of judgment. And you remember the ending of the book of Jude, Jude 24, that God is able to make us stand in his presence blameless with great joy. Hebrews 10, 17 says the sins of believers will be remembered no more. And listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8. Jesus Christ will confirm you to the end blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're dealing with here is not a judgment for sin. Sin for the believer has already been judged, has already been assessed, has already been seen for what it is, and has already been condemned in the flesh in Christ at the cross. One author, one author his name is Arthur, so he is an Arthur and an author. Arthur Predom writes this. A saint will never again come into judgment on account of his natural or inherited iniquity. For he is already dead judicially with Christ and is no longer known or dealt with on the footing of his natural responsibility. As a man, he has been weighed and found wanting. He was born under condemnation to a natural heritage of wrath and nothing good has been discovered in his flesh. But his guilt has been obliterated by the blood of his Redeemer and he is freely and justly pardoned for his Savior's sake. Because Christ is risen from the dead, he is no longer in his sins. He is justified by faith and is presented in the name and on the merits of the just one before God. And of this new and ever-blessed title to acceptance, the Holy Spirit is the living seal and witness. Into judgment, therefore, on his own account, he cannot come. What is the relationship between the Bema Seat judgment and the gospel? The gospel qualifies you to be at the Bema Seat judgment and to be rewarded for a life of faith. Now, what is this assessment? If it's not about sin, this is an assessment of the stewardship of the Christian life. Again, Revelation 19.8 19, discusses righteousnesses, plural. Not justifying righteousness, but the righteousnesses of the Christian life produced by the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. What's given here, what's lost here at this judgment is reward. Gain and loss of reward, that's what happens at this judgment. You might be asking, but does my sin relate to this judgment at all? And the answer to that is yes, there is a relationship between sins here in the body and what happens at the Bema Seat Judgment. There's no condemnation, there's no videotape rolling of sins remembered. But consider this, when we sin here, 
It, it creates a vacuum, something of a black hole for obedience. To give up time and resources and spiritual energy unto things that God hates and that Christ had to pay for at the cross. It's a sap of opportunity. It's a sink of capacity. And think about when we sin, we grease the skids for further sin. You're not only putting a black hole in a time stamp on your life where I could have lived for Christ but didn't, but you've also paved an easier path for failure to live for Christ when you could. We create habits and tracks and deep ruts that are easy to get into and hard to get out of. And fighting a hard battle against sin and fighting for righteousness and cultivating a heart pleasing to the Lord that bears fruit into eternity is hard work, and you set a pattern for making that hard work just a little easier every time you do it. It's one of the great gifts of God just to the human constitution is the, is the reality of habit and pattern. We've talked about this before. If I had to learn how to tie my shoes for the first time every morning or learn how to shave my face for the first time every morning, I'd never get out of the house, or I would with cuts and slippers. And God has just created us in such a way that we don't have to relearn things all the time. The bad side of that is you sin and you teach yourself to sin. You pursue righteousness and you cultivate habits and patterns and there's a blessing, there's a sowing and reaping principle in that. And so when we sin in this life, it, it's not as if those sins get rolled up into the great videotape of the Bema Seat Judgment but they do create a vacuum, a, a vortex where godly living just disappears. The other aspect, and, and we'll see this as we uh, look at what is rewarded, what is actually rewarded, we discover that motives, thoughts, secrets of the heart are critical. And we can do things for the Lord with mixed motives. I'm confident we always do in this life. But to varying degrees, the purification of the work of the Spirit in the heart produces better or better yet quality of work. And as we'll see next time when we're in 1 Corinthians 3, it is the quality of work that is assessed by fire so does your sin relate to this judgment? Yes, uh, you, you infect the good things that the Holy Spirit has prepared for you to walk in by mixed motives. And sin produces a neglect of godly living, both now and as a pattern into the future. Just by way of example, um, where sin creates distractions. First Peter 4, 8 reminds us the end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded, do you remember it, and self-controlled so that you can pray. And just think about the relationship between those two things. Uh, to, to not be clear-minded, to not be self-controlled is a, is a neglect of spiritual fruit and obedience. It is sin to be out of control and to lack self-discipline. And the injunction in 1 Peter 4, 8 is to have those things, cultivate those things, pursue those things so that you can pray. And as we looked at last week, prayer before the Lord is rewarded by the Lord who sees what is done in secret. And you think about the book of Revelation several times, that golden bowl of incense before the altar of the Lord in the throne room in heaven is filled. And what is it filled with? The prayers of the saints which are a pleasing aroma and worship before the Lord. Sometimes we think about prayer just in terms of, well, I prayed, and did it get answered yes or no, or maybe, or later, or silence? I don't know. But there's more to prayer than that. A life yielded to God expressed in the, just the simple cry of a child, Father, help. 
ends up in the golden bowl before the altar of the Lord and is worship and pleasing before him because we're dependent, he's God, we're created beings in need. And our expression of that is an expression of devotion that heaven sees and heaven benefits from and it extends into eternity. So be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. There's a relationship there between, between reward that extends into eternity and temporal living. There's something as simple as just being self-controlled, clear-minded, disciplined. So what kinds of things get rewarded? Turn to Matthew chapter five. Verse 12. I guess we better back up to verse 11. Blessed are you, Jesus says, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad. Why? Because persecution is so much fun. No, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What is one of the things that's rewarded? Persecution suffered. Persecution suffered, Jesus says, is rewarded. And that, that reminder just helps us think with an eternal perspective. Not instant gratification, not immediate consequences, but further down the line. What I'm doing now matters forever. Matthew 5, 46, what else gets rewarded? Selfless love. Look at this, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? What's the implication there? I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. That's not really love, that's just a business transaction. But selfless, self-emptying love with no expectation in return gets rewarded. God has eternal rewards for such love. Look at Matthew chapter six. We won't read uh, all of one through 17, but just, just remember um, these refrains. Verse four, or verse three, when you give to the poor, do not let your, le let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. When you pray, go into your inner room and your father who sees what is done in secret, secret will reward you. When you fast, don't look miserable, but your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Giving, praying, and fasting are all said to be rewarded by God. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. What is rewarded? Support and participation in the ministry of others. He who receives a prophet, verse 41, in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Do you have to be a prophet to be important in God's economy? Um, actually, supporting a prophet brings about a prophet's reward. This is significant, participation in and support of the ministry of others. Jesus says, receives a reward. Look at Luke 14. Another category of what is rewarded is humble generosity. Starting in verse 13, when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Humble generosity is rewarded. And the passage we'll look at next time we're in this series, 1 Corinthians 3, details the building up of Christ's church. 
Paul planted, Apollos watered. He goes on to describe this imagery of the edifice, the, the building up of the church through the ages. And each man must be careful how he builds upon it. That's not just about the foundation level of, of apostles and prophets. That's about every individual Christian and how you participate in the expansion of the gospel in the church age through the body of Christ. Be careful. How you do what you do will be assessed. But the building up of Christ's church for every member of Christ's body is rewarded. And then the bearing of fruit is rewarded. Over and over again in these rewards passages, it is repentance that leads to the bearing of fruit that receives a reward. I want you to think about just ordinary activities. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians 5 is an eternal perspective chapter for believers. And we'll look at verse 10 again. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body. In other words, the things you do while you are on this earth in the flesh, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And, and bad here uh, is probably not the, uh, the, the, the indication here is, is not the idea of moral perversity, but that which is worthless, that which just has no value, that which is meaningless. Look at Ephesians chapter six. Beginning in verse five. This takes the idea of rewards down to the mundane, down to the ordinary, down to the daily grind, your nine to five. Slaves, be obedient to those that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. That is really interesting. In the first century, a, a slave in the Roman system of slavery who had a bad master or a good one, who saw his real boss as Jesus and who worked so as to please Jesus and labor for him so that every widget made was worship is rewarded for every motion of that worship. Implications for how we go to work. Not, e not in a slave system, but I've got a boss. Pays my paycheck. Who, who's my boss? I serve the Lord. And it doesn't matter what the details are of the nine to five. It doesn't matter what the, the, the mundane features of your occupation. But you do it for him and he rewards it. And in the same passage, of course, you have instructions to how masters would treat their slaves, how uh, everybody in different relationships in humanity would treat one another, children to parents, fathers to children, et cetera, wives to husbands. And the implication in all of this is in the mundane aspects of every capacity of your life, you must do what you do as worship before the Lord. And it is to be rewarded. Ordinary activities, the deeds done in the body, good or bad. And it's critical for us to understand in all of these categories that it is not merely that you suffered persecution that gets a reward. It matters how you suffered persecution. Well, I had a bad day. It's all gonna karma out in the end. That's not the biblical doctrine of rewards. 
but suffering endured with an eye of faith toward the Lord, dependence on him, trusting in him, that's what gets rewarded. Not prayers prayed, but prayers prayed that went beyond the ceiling. (laughs) Prayers prayed not for show, but dependence on him from the heart. Not fasting for applause or giving for recognition. It's not the thing itself, the deed itself that is the re- that gets the reward. The how and the why are critical. Not just that you participated in the ministry of others, but how you did and why you did. As 1 Corinthians 3 says, the quality of each man's work will become evident by fire. I gave Okay, what was the quality of your giving? Well, it was $7.83. No, not the amount. (laughs) What was the quality? Generous, selfless, love for others, for God's ministry. I just want to give, and I don't need other people to know about it. Motives, thoughts, words, the secrets of the heart, all of these things. And and those realities, the, the motives, thoughts, careless words, heart secrets, that litany of things assessed shows up in all the judgments. Sheep and goat judgment, uh, the great white throne judgment for the unbelieving dead. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, Yahweh, search the heart, I test the mind to give according to each person according to what he has done. Jesus said every careless word will be assessed. Revelation 2, 23, Jesus says, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I give to each one of you according to your deeds. Jesus sees right through all the surface stuff. He knows the difference between a a good deed done and that which is living sacrifice worship before him from the heart. Well, we don't see that stuff. We, we see the, the, the guy helping the little old lady across the street. We don't know why he's doing it. Hey, that's nice. What a great guy. We, we don't know why he's doing that. But the Lord knows it all. So what will the rewards be? We, we've got a glimpse of some of the things that God intends to reward. What, what activities, what, what mindsets get rewarded, but... But what are the rewards themselves? Again, if we're going to a place where the streets are made of gold, and and look, in the ancient world, uh, they didn't use asphalt. They threw trash on the ground, predominantly, until it was hard packed and became a a walkable, wagonable uh, street. That was the, the common road in cities. The cities in heaven are gonna be made of pure gold. So as a reward, do you, do you need a, an extra bag of gold coins to carry around? I, I don't think that's the idea of rewards. What is it? Well, first we have to recognize that there are degrees of reward and there is singular reward. Both of these things are true in our Bible. Uh, singular reward is eternal life. Jesus says to those who have followed him, enter into your rest, enter into the joy of your master, welcome home, and everybody gets the same reward. There is a leveling reality to eternal life that it doesn't matter if you were a thief on a cross or you were Polycarp who followed Jesus, that was a disciple of the Apostle John, for 80 and six years. The same reward. How do we know that? Look look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus is telling a parable. And there were laborers hired at different hours of the day. And they all agreed to a denarius, a day's wage. It was a a generous offer uh, for people standing around and waiting for employment. And it was a really generous offer for those who started at successively later hours in the day. And listen to the early laborers who complained. They grumbled at the landowner, verse 12, saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. And he answered and said, friend, am I 
doing you wrong? Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. And you know, the, the leveling, equalizing reality of the grace of God and the gospel is offensive to those who trust in themselves, who count on their own works to make them right before God. I remember having painful conversations with my grandfather who said, look, if Jeffrey Dahmer could ever get forgiven, I'm not believing that message. And Jeffrey Dahmer was a mass murderer and a cannibal. And it's awful to think about, but the reality is the grace of God in Christ can forgive any sinner who comes to him. And the thief on the cross is a great reminder of a guy who lived in rebellion against God, rebellion against human authorities, even mocked God the Son while he hung on the cross and then turned to him in faith in his last moments. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. The reward, eternal life. What? <laughs> what did he get in exchange for the life that he lived? That is offensive if you're a moralist, and you've come, if you've come to grips with who you really are before a holy God, you say, yes, that is my only hope, I'm that guy. And if you're Polycarp, who followed Christ for 86 years, you still say, oh, by the skin of my teeth, by the grace of God, I got in. What mercy to grumble against the Lord that, no, I worked so hard for all these years and you're telling me that guy gets in, he gets eternal life too, everybody gets a denarius, that's not fair. What does that reveal? That reveals a heart that never understood grace. So there's a sense in which the reward for living for Christ is eternal life. Everybody gets a denarius. Romans chapter 10 echoes the same sentiment. Romans 10, 12. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Decades lived in faithful, yielded service to the Lord and a last heartbeat conversion. What do they get? Riches abounding from a generous God. And yet, there are also degrees. The Bible speaks of both of these realities, that eternal life is the reward for faith, for belief. And within that reward called eternal life, there are varying degrees of reward. We walked through some of those last week. I turn your attention again to Matthew chapter 25. Just to remind ourselves of, of what truly is a neglected doctrine Matthew 25 and verse 21, the master said to the slave, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And again in verse 23, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Now, one slave had been given five talents and got five talents more. The second slave had been given two talents and got two talents more. An investment of capacity, an enterprising use of ability and gifts and opportunity rewarded with more, more. Varying degrees. Look at Luke chapter 19. Similar story, a nobleman from a distant country called 10 of his slaves, gave them 10, 10 minas, denomination of money. And when he came back, he asked for an accounting. The first appeared, verse 16, saying, Master, your mina has made 10 minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing, you are to be in authority over 10 cities. The second came saying, your mina master has made five minas. You are to be over five cities. And you see varying degrees of rewards based on various usage of the same one mina. One made 10, one made five. One is now in charge of 10 cities, the next in charge of five. 
these degrees of reward at the judgment are, are an important aspect. What are these rewards? Well, we've already seen cities being given, and uh, we see a couple other indications. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus says to his disciples, to the, to the 11 and, and to all those who follow him, whoever follows me, he says, you'll be sitting upon thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. What is that? That is a reference to kingdom administration. When Jesus comes in his glorious return in Revelation 19 and establishes his kingdom on the earth for a thousand years, there will be things to do, administration to be accomplished, oversight, governing, being in charge. Matthew 24 says similarly, being in charge of possessions, that is, having authority and responsibility. And as we just read in Luke 19, you will have authority over 10 cities or five cities. That is, again, authority, responsibility, uh, privilege, and service. I believe the rewards are indicative of varying capacities for fullness of life in God's presence, serving him with our varieties of capacities for service. The rewards are a, a varying capacity for fullness of life in God's presence, serving him with the varieties of capacities that God gives. And faithfulness with little things here means greater access to greater capacity and greater responsibilities for service there. And think about it, you and I are not the same. Everyone in this room is different. Everyone has different personality. Everyone has a different duration of life, different opportunities, different circles of relationship, different capacities, different gifts. And I love in the English language this word talent. It was a, a denomination of money in the ancient world, but it has come over to mean for us in English Someone's talented. We don't, we don't mean he has a bunch of coins in his pocket. We mean he's been given stewardship of responsibilities because he has abilities that are God-given. It's a really good word when you think about the word talent. It's actually an English word reflection of the parable of the talents. That everything you have is a stewardship from God. And we're all different in those things. And God has composed the body with varying gifts so that we complement one another and serve the growth of the body. If we were all armpits, the whole body would be an armpit and wouldn't be a body. Uh, we have various capacities. We've been placed by the Holy Spirit into a body which is his with Christ as the head for his purposes. And you think about it, when you are serving Christ full-hearted, don't you just get lost in the joy of it? Oh, I just love him. I think about all that he's done for me, and I just want to love him. Yeah, but aren't you obligated? Yes, I'm obligated, and I love it. I just want to serve him. And then when you are an encouragement to someone else in the body, and they grow in Christ as a result, there is nothing better. And we get glimpses and tastes of that. Can you imagine if that joy, your joy in God, his love for you, his love in you, shedding abroad to other people and being a benefit to others and the multiplication of enjoyment that that creates into eternity and greater capacities for that. Look, nobody is going to feel lacking at the Bema Seat Judgment. If you happen to be a, a 50 gallon drum or a thimble, you'll be full. You will have enjoyment in the presence of God and you will be given riches in abundance that you just can't quite contain. And there will be larger vessels and smaller vessels. Even in the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul describes those differences in glory. Even as one star varies from another in brightness, not everybody at the resurrection is the same. There are varying degrees of glory. That is the reflection of God's own glory reflected in those who were designed, created, built, and redeemed for that very purpose. 
a greater capacity to glorify God, a, a greater capacity to serve him. Look again at Revelation chapter 22. This is a depiction of the eternal state. And God makes this promise, there will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his slaves will serve him. His slaves will serve him. In the eternal state, those who have been redeemed, blood-bought, co-heirs, justified, adopted, sons and daughters, kings and queens of the universe are still slaves. And they'll serve him. And it's gonna be fun all the time. This capacity to serve the Lord, which is our greatest joy, is part and parcel with what the varying degrees of reward are. And this gets really close to what mankind was designed by God to be from the beginning. Before the fall, created into God's image to Lord, to rule, to be God's sub-regents in his universe, in his created order. And we've gotten this thing fouled up since Genesis 3, and there's no real recovery of it until sin is eradicated. We catch glimpses of what selfless, sacrificial love looks like in lordship. We see it perfectly in Christ. We see it imperfectly in the Christian life. But we will see it perfectly when everything is set right, which is why creation longs to be set free from its subjection to frustration and futility because we're a bunch of sinners. And when redeemed saints resemble Christ in his selfless, loving, lordship, subregent ruling of the universe, the universe is gonna like it. It cranes the neck, longing to see what that's gonna be like. And this idea of stewardship of gifting, faithful of little things here, given more capacity there, gets back at this very idea of what we are to be as God's creatures. What is all this for? What, what practical implication does this doctrine have for us? I want to lay out a few. We'll get into some more next time we're together in 1 Corinthians 3. But just thinking about this, I hope, directs your heart towards eternity. And it's a very practical look forward. This does things for us. I, I do not believe, when you read people that, that write about the Bema Seat Judgment, people will talk about uh, shame and regret um, I don't know that that's possible there. But I do believe that these texts are designed to promote shame and regret for us here at opportunities lost and to motivate us to faithful living. We are, number one, to be motivated to a non-wasted life. And if we could only but see rewards in heaven, we would put all our eggs in the basket of living for the Lord every moment here. I'm convinced. Again, it's like having a time machine and knowing the lottery numbers and going back. We, we have this promise from God that's better than knowing the lottery numbers, that there is great and increasing reward for a faithful stewardship of responsibilities and opportunities here. And if we only would believe that, we would live diligently. John Anderson has over his desk, I don't know if you have it here, is it at home? The Fervency Springs. Um, John MacArthur's quote, Fervency Springs from a vision of heaven's reward. Now that's right to catch a glimpse of everything the reward is in heaven from just knowing Christ, this is eternal life, that they may know you and the one whom you've sent, John 17, three, as well as increasing and greater capacity for love and glorification and service to God into eternity. These things would motivate us to fervent living for the Lord here. Secondly, it's a motivation for a disciplined life. 
Listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive an imperishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave. And strikingly there, Paul says, so that after I have preached to others, I will myself not be disqualified. That is, tested and found unapproved, ungenuine. And while the, the Bama seat judgment isn't a, uh, uh, an exposure of apostasy, Paul's words there are a thinking forward to eternity that drives the way he lived his life on earth. Thirdly, this is really important for us to leave final assessments to the Lord. Leave final assessments to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness, and he will disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. It was back in 2020, you, you, you either remember that year or you don't. That, that we were in Romans 14. And that was a, a critical time for us to be in a section of scripture that dealt with preferences, that dealt with gray areas, that dealt with forging personal convictions and how to live when there are variations in those things in the body of Christ. Do you remember this text, Romans 14, five, one person regards one day above another, one regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. No one lives for himself, verse seven. No one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. To this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. And then listen to verse 10. But you, why do you judge your brother? Why do you brother, uh, regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Every knee bows, every tongue give praise to God. Verse 12, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. But determine this, don't put stumbling blocks in front of each other. Oh, what did we learn about preferential issues and gray areas there? There's a final assessment coming where God sees the motives of the heart and two believers in the same body can carry on two different activities and both be pleasing to the Lord. They can both be doing the same exact external activity and one pleasing to the Lord and one not. The question is the secrets of men's hearts. So you don't judge one another. On preferential issues, gray areas, the forging of personal convictions and strong beliefs, we're not talking about biblical commands and prohibitions. But leave final assessment to the Lord. That is so critical, and the Bema Seat Judgment helps us do that. God, you know the secrets of men's hearts. You know the quality of each man's work, and you will assess that. I don't have to assess that. I, I don't have to make guesswork at the internal workings of mixed motives of why somebody is doing what they're doing. I can, I can trust the Lord with that. That is not to discount, by the way, uh, Berean discernment, right? The assessing of false doctrine, those kinds of things, that, that all has to be in place. But we're talking about believers' actions in, in non-command and non-prohibition areas that we just leave to the Lord. We trust him with all of that. That is a tremendously liberating doctrine. Fourthly, Implications here for our own self-examination on our motives. Don't trust yourself. Just be confident, know yourself well enough to know that the best things that you do are tainted. God's gonna sort them all out in the end, 1 Corinthians 3.10, but, 
The quality of work can be improved where we examine the motives of our hearts. Work to be pleasing to the Lord from the heart in all things. And remember this lastly this morning, everyone's different. God is given by his own sovereign purposes, different capacities, gifts, opportunities, amounts of time. I am confident that we will be humbled, surprised on the day of rewards. Wait, they, they, I, I remember earthly life. That guy never did anything for the Lord. How do you know? I, I've always been moved by the Chinese pastors at the communist revolution who were sent to solitary confinement and spent decades. So you think you train, you train, you study, and you're gonna be a pastor and you're a pastor for two years and then you're in jail for 60. <laughs> Ministry failure. <laughs> Heaven knows. God knows. God rewards. Jesus said, many of those who will be first will be last, and many of the last will be first. There is a great reversal coming from appearances to realities that only God sees. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for being so gracious, so far beyond what we could think of. We are slightly aware of what we deserve, your infinite fury against our sin. You know the secrets of our hearts. You know better than we do all the mixed motives and tainted things, and yet we just want to surrender our lives to you afresh, even this morning, yielded in faith to you, believing your promises, seeking to be diligent and fervent for those things that last into eternity. Well, we trust you with these things. Help us even more in Jesus' name. Amen.